just going to introduce Dr. Hossein Lajarayli, who's the president mm -hmm. of the um, Association of Iranian Researchers. I won't attempt a French name. And um, he will speak in Farsi, but you have the translation of what he's saying on your seats. There is a little sheet of what he's saying. So can I please ask you to come? سلام و درود من بر همگی شما و سپاس از حضورتون نشست امروز ما به برابری آزادی ادیان و مذاهب در ایران اختصاص داده شده که یکی از اساسی ترین مباحث حقوق انسانی در اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر است از آنجایی که شناسایی حیثیت و کرامت ذاتی تمامی اعضای خانواده بشری و حقوق برابر و سلب ناپذیر آنان اساس آزادی ادالت و صلح در جهان است این نشست به دین شکل ترتیب داده شده این کنفرانس به نقض حقوق انسانی بیشماری از هموطنان غیر شیعی مذهب و غیر مسلمان من میپردازد که هیچ خطایی نداشتهاند جز این که خواستند بر اساس ماده دو اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر فارغ از هر نوع تبعیزی از آزادی انتخاب دین و مذهب خود برخوردار باشند بر اساس ماده سه اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر هر فردی حق زندگی کردن آزادی و امنیت شخصی را باید داشته باشد اگرچه حکومت جمهوری اسلامی بر اساس مفاد مندرج در قانون اساسی اصل سیزده سه دین دیگر زرتشتی، مسیحی و یهودی را به رسمیت میشناسد ولی در عمل هیچ کدام از پیروان این ادیان اجازه و امکان فعالیت رسمی ندارند و مهمتر آن که مسلمانان سنی مذهب که به نسبت شیعیان بیشترین تعداد مسلمانان در جهان را دارا هستند یک میلیارد و چهارصد میلیون در مقابل صد و ده میلیون شیعی حق داشتن یک مسجد و عبادتگاه در شهر بزرگی مانند تهران را نیز نداشتند و در بسیاری از موارد نیز به دلیل ترس و وحشتی که حکومت ایجاد کرده است ناگزیر به تظاهر کردن و غیر واقعی نشان دادن حقوق و آزادی های خود نیز شده اند اگر من بخواهم به دیگر هموطنانم که در زمره پیروان سه دین رسمی و شناخته شده در ایران نیست نیستن نیز بپردازم ناگزیر باید در جهت حقوق دیگر هموطنان باهایی هم هموطنانی که در زمره دراویش و اهل حق هستند و پیروان دیگر ادیان و مذاهب و آینها و حتی کسانی که نمیخواهند پیرو هیچ دین و آینی هستند اشاره ای داشته باشند که آنها نیز باید بتوانند این حق را داشته باشند که بنا بر ماده 18 اعلامیه جهانی حقوق بشر از آزادی اندیشه، وجدان و دین بهرمند شوند. این حق مستلزم آزادی تغییر دین یا اعتقاد و همچنین آزادی اظهار دین با اعتقاد در قالب آموزش دینی، عبادتها و اجرای آینها و مراسم دینی به تنهایی یا به صورت جمعی به طور خصوصی یا به طور عمومی و همچنین بر اساس ماده 19 منشور جهانی حقوق بشر از آزادی عقیده و بیان برخوردار بوده و از ابراز آن هیچ گونه وحشتی نداشته باشند در خاتمه لازم میدانم به تمامی هموطنانم و به جامعه بین المللی اشاره نمایم و هشدار دهم یک تاریخ و برپایی این نشست دقیقا سه روز پیش از رسیدن به آخرین مهلت توافقنامه بین المللی در رابطه با انرژی هسته‌ای 24 نوامبر 2014 است و این کنفرانس هشداری است بر مقامات بین المللی که هر نوع توافق با رژیم جمهوری اسلامی نباید با نادیده انگاشتن حقوق بشر در ایران انجام پذیرد دو ادامه حکومت جمهوری اسلامی نه تنها آزار و اذیت و حقارت برای هموطنان غیر مسلمان و غیر شیعی هم ایجاد کرده که می رود با ایجاد یک جنگ شیعه و سنی منطقه را نیز به آتش بکشاند 
انجمن پژوهشگران ایران هدف و خواست خود در این کنفرانس را بران نهاده است که بتواند به دنبال 22 سال فعالیت و تلاش گسترده خود همچنان برای رسیدن به برابری و آزادی تمام هموطنانش خاصه پیروان ادیان و مذاهبی که تحت ظلم و ستم حکومت ایدئولوژیک مذهبی قرار دارند فائق آید و با پشتیبانی و کمک تمامی هموطنان خود و مراجع بنومرالی در راه برابری و آزادی تمامی ایرانیان فارق از هر گونه تمایزی به ویژه از حیث نژاد، رنگ، جنس، زبان، دین، عقیده سیاسی یا هر عقیده دیگری گام بردارد با آرزوی جامعه برابر و آزاد و ورود دوباره ما به جامعه بینومرالی سپاس خوزم. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask um, my panelists to join me very shortly, but I just wanted to tell you what you're sitting on. There is an introduction to what um, ACI does, a report of a conference series that we've had on um, right to life against death penalty in Iran. But crucially to do with this conference, we had hoped to have completed a um, report uh, to present to you today. Um, in the last nine months, we've been conducting interviews with various religious and belief groups in Iran um, to hear firsthand from them their daily life experiences in Iran. Unfortunately, due to the volume that um, we received, we just were not able to translate it all in time for presentation today. But what we have done, um, based on what we've learnt from them, um, is to put on your seats the first page of the report and on the last page um, our suggested recommendations for discussion today. It's just our suggestions. You're all experts who are sitting here and we hope that at the end in the, by the third panel we will be able to formulate um, the recommendations that we can then present to the international community and follow from there on. So uh, since you are all experts, please help us in formulating these recommendations at the end, whether you, we do it today or you email us and we can um, carry on. We are happy to have Dr. Shahid here with us. He will be able to take our message to wherever he goes. And uh, we've also got a message from the uh, UN uh, Special Rapporteur on Religion, Dr. Heinrich Belfeld, um, which we'll listen at the beginning of the second uh, panel. And I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with me for the three panels. I'll be doing my best to chair um, the session today. Um, can I please ask my first panel to join me? Uh, Mr. Sabi is here. Um, Ms. Bechratnia, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Soleimani, Ms. Alai. Uh, can I just ask you to pick your name from there and bring it with you, please, when you come to sit down? the report that we've done so far. Um, and if anyone wants to have a look, you're more than welcome through uh, during the break to have a look. Basically, what we've tried to do is to familiarize everyone um, with the legal obstacles to equality. We're putting our emphasis on equality. And what I've asked my panelists um, to do today is to offer us here a picture of life in the last 16 months since President Hassan Rouhani's come into office because of the promises that he made and because of the citizenship charter that he's um, produced and because that he has appointed a special advisor on minorities issues and they've been very active. Um, the timing was picked um, particularly to follow the UPR and the recommendations that come out of UPR. We're happy that the mandate got voted a few days ago at um, the General Assembly and as Dr. Lajavadi said, we have three days to go with the nuclear um, dialogue which is happening. So um, it's a very important time period that we're here. Um, we structured it because in Iran um, we have recognized religious groups and we have unrecognized religious groups. We've tried to structure to hear first from the recognized religious groups who are accorded rights and protection in um, the constitution of how their life has been. Um, you'll see through um, what's on your chairs that a lot of people couldn't share information because they were very afraid of the repercussions for their community. I have panelists here who shared that fear with me for their community <laughs> of how this is going to um, impact on them, hopefully positively. 
um, but we've decided that um, because the Jews in Iran, um, we've had a very long history, um, but in the last 35 years, the numbers of the Jews of Iran have decreased by sevenfold. If um, in um, before the revolution, the last census, it's in your thing, um, shows that we had 65,000 Jews in Iran. The last census, which was um, two years ago, shows that we only have 8,000 Jews. So the numbers reduced greatly, can, which can only um, show, um, in my opinion, persecution and the fact that they felt it necessary to leave Iran. We're here from the expert now and um, what's happening. So please. Hamid Sabi is going to be our first speaker. Thank if you. I can just introduce you very briefly. He has only given me three lines for his introduction. That's enough. He's, <laughs> he's a lawyer with an international practice. He has a very long history of um, fighting on behalf of Iran and Iranians. He's a chairman of the Iranian Jewish Center and a member of the executive committee of Iran Tribunal, which I'm sure if you're a Londoner, you would have heard about it. And if you're not a Londoner, I think we would have also still heard about it. So, please, how was yours? We have 10 minutes. Thank you. Everything is on. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yes. Wonderful. May I challenge your maths first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Look, you can challenge the Islamic Republic's figures. They're not my figures. <laughs> okay. figures. We'll, get, we'll get to the figures we'll get later. To the figures. Okay. As Roya mentioned, uh, Iran has the oldest continuing Jewish community in diaspora. The Jewish migration to Iran dates back to 2,700 years ago, and after the conquest of Babylon by Cyrus the Great, the position of Jewish community in Iran and their numbers increased and improved substantially. The community enjoyed freedom and equal rights as other citizens of the Persian Empire. Although I'm sure that the history of Persian Jews is well known, and if you want, I have a book on this history with the complete background of the activities of Jews in Iran. But the reason I refer to the history is that Jews came to Iran as friends, and they considered the Iranian people as a liberator for them. Cyrus the Great is mentioned in the Bible as Messiah, which is technically different from other migrations of Jews, where the Jews were, were treated as outsiders, as not peaceful people, and anti-Semitism grew because of that. But between Iranians and Jews, they, or Jews were also Iranians, but the anti-Semitism were not that strong in Iran, simply because Jews did not consider themselves an outsiders in Iran, and lived uh, in peaceful and quiet manner for many centuries in Iran. And the difficulties that Jews had in Europe and recently in Arab and Muslim lands were less apparent in Iran. The Constitutional Revolution of 1906 brought equality before law for all the residents of Iran, irrespective of their race, color, ethnicity, or religion. Although certain civic rights were reserved for Muslims, and some of them for Shia Muslims, nevertheless Jews and other minority religious groups enjoyed equal rights in all other aspects. There were restrictions in holding public offices and at the level of ministers as well as judges for non-Muslims. There were also limitations in being elected to parliament. And there were three members of parliament for three recognized minorities, later increased to four and then five. But otherwise, members of different faiths in Iran even those who were not re recognized as religious minorities were entitled to enjoy other rights and freedom, and the law did not distinguish between them. Before the revolution, we have some 100,000 Jews living in Iran. It's a bit different from those figures. <laughs> even today, Iran has the second, uh, one of the largest Jewish minorities living in a Muslim country in the world. Iran has the second largest Jewish religious sites after Israel and has played an important role in Jewish history. I mean, we have many important Jewish institutions in Iran, the tomb of Daniel, the Esther and Mordechai, and so on and so forth. Coming to the Islamic Revolution of 1979, 
the basic norm of Iranian legal system changed drastically, so subordinating all the citizens' rights and all the laws of the country to the tenets of Islam, with the leader of the republic being the ultimate interpreter of the God-given laws. Although the Constitution nominally recognized religious minorities, only Jews, Christians, and Zarossians, and no one else, and they were, again, nominally given similar rights compared to, to those granted under 1906-1907 Constitution, nevertheless, the over overriding effect of the Islamic law meant that in the process, the concept of equality before law was changed for Iranian citizens. In law and in practice, Muslims were given better rights than non-Muslims. Men were preferred over women. And followers of unrecognized religious, Baha'is, Yazidis, Dervishis, ahl al and the others were given no rights. In the process of purging non-Muslims from various positions started with the purge of judiciary, where all the supporters of the former regime and non-Shiite Muslims and women were excluded from the bench. Universities and other academic institutions were purged, and finally, non-Muslim civil servants were made redundant. On the political side, Jews were quickly removed from any important or political position they, they had. The Jewish representative of parliament eventually became a spokesman for the Palestinian state and would mo only make statements where it was needed to condemn the acts of aggression of state of Israel. However, Jews were allowed to freely practice their religion. Synagogues around the country were considered to be inviolable, and Jews were allowed to freely attend synagogues and exercise their religious rights without restriction. This situation continues today. We have 11 synagogues in Tehran that are open and have not been affected by whatever the regime has done other places. And I think in that respect, the freedom to exercise the religion for Jews had been no serious interruption in that respect. But Jewish education suffered considerably due to restrictions that were imposed on having the, an overseer appointed by the government to Jewish schools. Some of the Jewish schools were closed down, but eventually after many years of campaigning, they allowed the Jewish schools to be reopened, although the headmaster had to be appointed by the government and invariably was one of the strict followers of Islamic code. And there were also a lot of interference with internal community affairs. The Ministry of Information had to vet all the community leaders, had to get the reports from every meeting, had to follow every member of the Central Committee, both in Tehran and provinces, and they openly challenged members that they were not considered to be appropriate by them and asked the community to remove them, or they re resign themselves. Of importance is the equality before law that was seriously undermined by the introduction of the Islamic Punishment Code. The number of murders of Jewish businessmen occurred in 1980s and 1990s. The authorities refused to investigate or even when the investigation was completed, the culprit received basically no punishment or was asked to pay a small amount as blood money. I'm told I wanted three minutes now. The consequence was that 80% of the Persian Jews left Iran, and we believe that we have something around 20,000 Jews left. The, sense, the census says 80. Yeah, a lot of people do not yeah. declare their identity Absolutely. because they don't want to be recognized as Jews. Still, it is the largest Jewish community in any Muslim country. As a result of the circumstances I explained, Jews have difficulty in finding employment in government institutions, and consequently, most Jews are either in private business or in profession, mostly in medicine. The Jewish community also suffered as a result of highly publicized events and trials, such as execution of the former head of Central Committee, Habib al Ghanian, and the incident of Shirazi Jews, where 13 Jews were arrested on charges of being spies of Zionism. The government of Islamic Republic, especially during the 
eight years of Ahmadinejad, encouraged anti-Semitism in Iran. This was done through the media that was controlled by the government, the uh, Islamic Republic's television, and Ahmadinejad started with the theory of myth of Holocaust, and there were massive amount of anti-Semitic propaganda in the state control radio and television. And they talked about these old stories of blood libel and Jewish conspiracy and all the stories that are old, like 150 years ago, were invented in Russia. One of the, in a letter that the head of community wrote to head of Iran radio and television system, he said, I'm, I'm happy to mention that although you have created so much anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic propaganda, it hasn't affected the Iranian people because they don't watch your program. Otherwise, rivers of blood would have been <laughs> running through this city. Notwithstanding the efforts by the government to demean and dehumanize Jews in Iran, Iranian people have continued their cordial and friendly relationship with Jews. On the personal level, those who live in Iran do not feel the anti-Semitism that the government is promoting. Naturally, Jews moved away from smaller towns and villages, and they are mainly residents in big cities like Tehran, Isfahan, and Shiraz. Thank you. Full stop. Full stop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I just ask you quickly, we, we got up to um, Ahmadinejad and our times up very quickly. Under the Rouhani presidency, has anything changed for the better, worse, or no change, in your opinion? The, the community feels a lot easier, but nothing on the ground had changed. No, uh, you, I, I guess you noticed that a year ago when President Rouhani went to uh, New York, he thought that it's necessary to carry the Jewish representative of the parliament with him to show that he's friendly with Jews, but th they are using Jews as a, as a means of getting closer to, Amer to Americans, but on the ground level, nothing significant has happened, but Nothing has become worse. Nobody is putting more pressure than the past. But the Ministry of Information keeps taps on everybody. They, they control all the meetings of Jews, and nothing happens and without access them. to synagogue is restricted? No, it has never been restricted. It's never been restricted. There's no like a congregation no. list that they have to give. No, the, they, these are members of this. No, they, they, there had not been any problem with that. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamid. Um, our next speaker is Shaheen Behadnia. She will be talking um, to us about the plight of um, the Zoroastrians, their situation of the Iranian Zoroastrians. Uh, Shaheen Behadnia is a joint honorary secretary of the World Zoroastrian Organization and religious affairs spokesperson for them. Uh, one of her main duties um, is to support um, Zoroastrian refugees who come here from Iran. But very interesting for me, um, she has set up a school as well as an old age home. Senior citizens. In yes. Senior citizens um, center in Yazd. And she's been um, supporting that in, in the last 15 years. So she has um, very tangible um, connection and information about um, what life there is like. So um, without further ado, thank, thank you. you. 10 minutes and you'll be getting my notes. OK. <laughs> well, I don't know how quickly I'll talk, but let me. <coughs> so I'm going to approach it a little bit like Hamid did, um, in as far as there's going to be a little historical background, and then I'll go into what's happening today. Um, although the original monotheistic religion of Iran, which all Iranians practiced until the onslaught of the Arabs, who brought Islam to Iran in the 7th century common era, today the Zoroastrian community stands as the smallest existing minority religion in the country. And that, of course, is in contradiction to the official census figures, but we can talk about that later if you want. It is, and I can tell you that, that is a first-hand piece of information. It is a religion on the brink of becoming extinct if we only account among the number of Zoroastrians those who were born into it through their parental religious affiliation. Leaders of the community inside Iran and even some um, respected figures who are presently abroad do not like to broadcast the specific numbers remaining in Iran for fear that our very low figures will cause panic to those who remain and give rise to more intense jubilation to those whose mission it is to see us finally disappear from the homeland which gave birth to our religion over 3,000 years ago. The official census figures, highly exaggerated and known to be highly inaccurate, are not challenged 
as those same leaders of ours tend to believe that this provides a sort of protection for our community. But however small the number of born Zoroastrians may be, it is open knowledge that the numbers of new Zoroastrians is growing rapidly throughout the provinces and cities of Iran. In areas where there were never registered born Zoroastrians, and Jomans or associations of Zoroastrians can now be found. Examples of such phenomenon being in Gilan, Khorasan, Kermanshah and Kashan, etc., where these associations have been founded by new Zoroastrians. Some Iranians go as far as to suggest that there may be millions just waiting for the opportunity to return freely to the first indigenous religion of Iran that taught equality of women and freedom of choice, the importance of environmental awareness and the pursuit of happiness through virtuous acts. Now, often the process of establishing small local cells consists of one person making contact via the internet with any one of a number of organizations of new Zoroastrians outside Iran. Within Iran, contact is made within these local cells via word of mouth, text messaging, telephoning and internet, and infrequent secret meetings in private houses and occasionally hired halls. Zoroastrian groups outside Iran are regularly contacted by Iranians both inside and outside Iran, desirous of finding out how they might undergo a ceremony of initiation and thus become Zoroastrians. There is one new Zoroastrian organization outside Iran which has posted instructions online about how the initiation ceremony should be conducted. And there is no shortage of requests to the dozens of Zoroastrian websites for information about our beliefs, texts and conversion. However, in Iran, these new Zoroastrian organizations and individuals rarely manage to mix with born Zoroastrians. Few of the individuals will have been able to have free access to a Zoroastrian priest or an official Zoroastrian place of worship. It is required of anyone who is not a born Zoroastrian wishing to participate in any Zoroastrian festival, such as Jashne Tirgan or we have uh, Jashne Sadeh, any of those things or ceremonies, they must have a letter of permission from the Ershad authorities and it is incumbent on the Zoroastrian organizers in those places to require the production of such a document from anyone they recognize as not one of their own community. Such a procedure is hardly likely to encourage attendance by new Zoroastrians who know well the penalties for showing an interest in a religion that is not the one they were born into. Even so, there are occasions when priests are on duty at the temples and they may be informally approached by an individual asking for clarification and guidance on certain matters. This is in fact a somewhat dangerous activity as plainclothes police and spies are known to enter the temples periodically to check what's going on there. And it has been reported that such spies have told the priests to desist from any conversation. <coughs> information about religious tenets is posted up on the walls and people are reminded that all information must be gleaned from that, these posters. The temples in Shiraz and Isfahan are known to be very strictly controlled, while those of Kerman and Yaz have become museums to which the public have access by buying a ticket, but they may not enter the area restricted to born Zoroastrians. So effectively, Zoroastrians have become like animals in a zoo. Because of the danger of being associated with proselytizing, priests tend to tell all people who approach them expressing a desire to undergo a conversion ceremony that this is not necessary and indeed all, not all born Zoroastrians by any means undergo such a process. So I have many friends who are Zoroastrian born. They haven't had an initiation ceremony. It's not essential. It is more important to start to think and behave as a Zoroastrian is supposed to by practicing honesty, kindness to others, the application of wisdom and logic in their decisions and actions on a day-to-day -day basis. They are encouraged to think about the truth and to dwell upon the nature of what is good and merely to become Zoroastrians in their hearts and minds rather than to be obsessed by the trappings of an outward ceremony. Some Zoroastrians who are born into the religion complain privately they have no longer any control over any of their own holy places, since gawpers and gazers come to our shrines. Worse still, some of them act with disrespect in a deliberate attempt to undermine and humiliate members of our community. Graffiti has been daubed on the walls of some of our temples, and our desert pilgrimage site of Pire Sabs or Chak Chak near the city of Yazd, is now sometimes more crowded out by tourists and their guides than practicants who feel self-conscious in front of the onlookers. Our abandoned towers of silence suffer a similar fate. And it is already some years that all the Zoroastrian-founded schools, a few of which still survive in Tehran, cannot be headed up by a Zoroastrian 
and nor are Zoroastrian principles any longer taught to the student body there. Books about Zoroastrianism in Farsi and Zoroastrian produced magazines are actively sought, but increasingly online publications are very popular and websites are the source of most information for the new Zoroastrians. Some Zoroastrians, when considering the imminent demise of their own community, take heart at the thought that there are these several million potentially intelligent, <coughs> intelligent young Iranians who have discovered the principles of Zoroastrianism and given the opportunity in a free society might openly embrace it. Reports have been made about new Zoroastrians preaching openly in streets, such in places like Mashhad and Tehran, but they are effectively committing suicide in so doing, since the outcome for some of them has been, if they are lucky, a prison sentence, sometimes execution for the more unfortunate. Indeed, the local cells have been out of touch with some of the sources outside Iran with whom they were actively communicating about two or three years ago. And it seems that a good number of the founder members of these local cells have been identified by the authorities but have managed to flee to nearby Turkey, where some have tried to regroup. Meanwhile, the cells have become inactive insofar as they have not recently been contacting the outside Iran groups. And meanwhile, the numbers of born Zoroastrians who make the reluctant choice to leave Iran keeps rising. And the main reason they leave is that there are small day-to-day -day vexations in the lives of Zoroastrians. Even the most qualified university graduates cannot easily find jobs, as it is well known that within the public sector, preference is almost always given to Muslim applicants, even with lower qualifications. Some sectors are no longer open to Zoroastrians, such as the armed forces, nor the ministries. And then faced with such difficulties, it is often the reluctant choice of young Zoroastrians to leave their homeland in the hope of more promising career prospects and a better life quality overseas. And although it is official policy that there is no interference in their day-to-day -day lives, the Zoroastrian communities in different areas are no longer free to choose their own representatives. Instead, the applicants for such positions on the local Zoroastrian councils, or indeed parliament, are vetted, and those who are deemed unsuitable are removed so that they cannot be voted into office. Needless to say, these rejected candidates are usually the most popular and energetic of their own community members. Land or property confiscation from Zoroastrians is probably becoming the most distressing and costly form of discrimination against members of our community in Iran today. Before the Islamic Revolution, Zoroastrians, generally speaking, had become highly educated, having founded schools for both boys and girls relatively early in the history of Iranian education. Added to that, many Zoroastrians, added to the high level of education, <coughs> many Zoroastrians were landowners. Since until the early 20th century, they were forbidden from engaging in any other professional occupation and were therefore by default almost exclusively agriculturalists. Thus, their wealth was invested in property, which today is being systematically confiscated on spurious grounds, which are nevertheless difficult to contest within a legal system that has a built-in bias against this minute and dwindling community. And indeed, not so very long ago, one Muslim cleric was recorded as having stated that Muslims shouldn't waste their time buying property belonging to Zoroastrians because within a short span of time, there'd be none left anyway and it would all be up for grabs. Now, I've been told that I must stop now, so I will stop now and I dare say the rest of it can come in question form. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask the question I asked Hamid from you? In the last 16 months, has the situation improved, got worse or hasn't changed at all? Well, I think that, as I mentioned, the numbers of people leaving is increasing. That's not going down. And so these statistics that um, are here are mysterious and we can explore them. But they're definitely going down. More and more young people are leaving, leaving behind older people. So that's one thing. The confiscations are also becoming more uh, pronounced. And um, going back further back, I mean, when Khatimi was in, in power, you know, he was sympathetic. He was a Yazdi himself. And he showed a little bit more and a kind of face value respect for Zoroastrians. In day-to-day -day life, the Zoroastrians, as you said, and the Jews, ha don't experience ordinary day-to-day -day encounters of prejudice or rudeness or uh, anti-Zoroastrianism. But um, in any official capacity, they do. So and the problem's not the members of public, it's the it's official... It's official, it's the official ways, because it's like ethnic cleansing of a more subtle sort. The door is open, out you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker of the recognized minority <laughs> religion group is Chrissy Taylor. She's here with us from Elam Ministries. 
Um, Chrissy is their research and advocacy um, lead, and um, if I can find you here, um, she coordinates their advocacy efforts and she works to document and raise awareness about the persecution that many endure in Iran. After completing her history degree at Oxford, Chrissy became an intern with Christian Solidarity Worldwide. It's an institute that I get a lot of information from, the same as your website now, Ilan Ministries. And um, she was placed uh, on the Africa and Middle East team with uh, CSW, and from there she's come on to Ilan Ministries. And we're very happy to have you here and hear what you've got to say. Um, I understand you've got two slides to show. Can you indicate um, to Nassim when you need them sure. to be put up? Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Roya has shared, I'll be sharing a bit about the Christian community. Um, I will be focusing primarily on Christians that, that don't come out of the ethnic Armenian Orthodox or Assyrian Orthodox churches. Um, these ancient communities are, as Roy said, recognized under the Article 13 of the Constitution. Um, this, of course, does not guard them from discrimination, as we've seen with the other supposedly recognized groups. But uh, the worst persecution, um, the harshest persecution, is reserved for converts to Christianity, uh, new Christians. Um, Iran's lack of tolerance for conversion away from Islam was articulated, I believe, most recently um, in an interview given by Ali Yuseni. Um, he's an advisor to Rouhani on ethnic and religious affairs. Um, he said to Fars news agency that converting to different sex, sects is illegal in our country. So apostate Christians have no chance of being recognized as Christian legally. Um, they're not protected by Article 13 of the Constitution. Um, and we panelists were asked to give a snapshot of life in Iran for these communities. So in order to do that, I'd like to primarily share a story with you of um, an Iranian Christian couple that I interviewed in September this year. Um, if we have Yakub and Mina up on the screen, the second slide. Um, this is Yakub and Mina, husband and wife, both Christians, but both um, from a Muslim background. Um, Yakub is a pastor. He led a church in his home for a small group of Christians. They'd meet for prayer and some Bible study. So um, if you picture the scene with me, it's the 20th of July, 2014. Mina's at home with their 12-year-old son and 6-year-old daughter. And out of the blue, she hears a knock on the door. Then there's, she opens the door to find three strangers on her doorstep. She tries to stop them coming in, saying, my husband's not home, you need to wait for him. But they push past her into the house, saying, we have your husband, he's in the car. So they tell her to cover her hair up, and she notices the guns in their belts and realizes they are security agents. So they start verbally abusing her and demanding that she bring them all the Bibles that they have, which, and she complies. Um, but to their filthy languages, language to her, she speaks up. She says, I'm not a murderer. We're not murderers. You don't need to speak to us like this. One of them turns to her and says, better you were a thief or a murderer than a Christian. Then they turn on her son. Uh, if we get the next slide up, you'll see him. He's 12 years old. He's called Elma. They start asking him, where does your father get the Bibles from? Elma doesn't respond. So then a couple of the agents haul him off into another room, bar the door so that Mina can't get in to protect him. And they start yelling at him, asking questions, intimidating him. And from the other side of the door, Mina hears Alma cry out as they hit him. And there's, of course, nothing she can do. So soon the agents come back in. They scoop up laptops and other items belonging to Yahoob. And they take Alma and Mina out to the cars. The frightened daughter is ushered to her neighbor's house. And then Yahoob, Mina, and Alma are driven to Tabriz prison. Alma and Mina are interrogated for the rest of the day and then released, but Yahub is held for 17 days. Of course, they had no idea it would be 17 days. It could have been months for all that they knew. Um, and during those 17 days, Yahub is held in solitary confinement, regularly taken for long sessions of interrogation, and is beaten many times. Um, these are words from him. During that time, they told me to recount my Christian faith nine times. They accused me of being a spy for Israel and trying to destroy Iran. They asked me who I was supported by, who I was connected to. They threatened to hang me. So after this period of intense psychological and physical pressure, he was released on bail on day 17. Two weeks after this, he received a summons to court. 
and this is him speaking again. He says, all the lawyers we spoke to said I would may well be tried for apostasy and action against national security. My family talked with a lawyer, and he advised me to repent of my Christian faith. They all said if I repented, I would go free, but if not, I would probably be charged with apostasy. My parents thought I should follow this advice. I replied that I could not do that. So it was after this, all these discussions, that Yacoub and family decided that they should leave the country for the family's safety. And many of the elements of Yacoub and Mina's story are common to what other Christians have been through in Iran, um, sometimes multiple times, or what they fear might happen at any moment. So Mina and Yacoub's um, story started with arrest and a house raid. This is a common pattern. Since Rouhani's assumption of office, uh, we know of at least 59 other Christians who've been arrested and detained, either for interrogation like Yacoub or to go and begin serving sentences. Uh, and these are just the cases that we know about. So in reality, there may be far more. And as we saw in Yacoub's story, he endured physical beating as well as psychological torture. This is not always the case for Christian detainees. Some endure the psychological games, but not the physical torture. But it does seem to be the case that the worst treatment is reserved for those who the interrogators believe are unknown to the outside world. Yacoub was unknown at the time of, his in of this incident. No one knew his name. We couldn't publicize about it. Uh, we know of another case where a Christian man, also a convert, um, was held in solitary confinement and interrogated for over 94 days in 2013, and he endured incredibly harsh torture. He was hung for hours at a time from the ceiling by his wrists, and he endured electric shock torture, and sometimes the electric baton was applied to his face. Um, his case was also unknown and unpublicized at the time. Um, so after interrogations and arbitrary detentions, Christians often then receive a summons to court, just as Yacoub did. Now, Yacoub left the country before the case was heard, and interestingly, it seems like this may have been what they were hoping for. I have heard of a group of Christians who had a court case in autumn this year, just a few months ago. Um, after their hearing, the judge told them that they were deliberately delaying issuing a verdict in order to give this group time to leave the country. Of course, Christians who leave Iran voluntarily save Iran the costs of court cases, of imprisoning Christians for many years, and it saves Iran from further international outcry. So it seems logical that Iran's government wants to see the Christian community remove itself from the country, um, for there simply are too many of them to jail them all. Um, some Christians, of course, do stay and do get sentenced. Um, there are at least 14 Christians serving prison sentences right now, and one under house arrest. Um, usually their Christian activities, such as meeting the house church or being in contact with other Christians outside of Iran, they're spun as political actions. Um, so Christians tend to be convicted on political crimes, such as action against national security or propaganda against the regime or spying. Um, so many Christians are accused of religious crimes like apostasy during interrogations, but in reality this rarely comes to fruit in the courtrooms. Um, and besides these ones that we know about serving sentences, there are scores of others in pretrial detention. Um, figures say it's maybe around the 50 mark. Uh, Christians also face difficulties in everyday life, not just the threat of imprisonment and, and torture. Christians um, cannot often be buried in Christian graveyards because many of them don't have baptism certificates. They're not issued for Muslim con converts from a Muslim background, and so permission for a Christian burial can often be denied. Um, so many Christian converts are buried with an Islamic ceremony. Um, education and employment, just as we heard a bit earlier, are, are very difficult for people who are not Shia Muslims. I spoke to a couple last month, um, and the lady in this couple had lost her place at university in summer 2013 because her Christian faith had been discovered. She'd nearly finished her BA degree and now has no chance of graduating. Um, her husband had lost his job around the same time because his Christian faith was discovered by his boss. Um, and this, I'm hearing these kinds of stories very regularly, although sadly I don't have de definite numbers of how many Christians have lost their jobs under Rouhani. Um, weddings as well are difficult. Converts can't marry as Christians. The registered churches that are still open, and there are only a few of them, have to report all of their ceremonies, so baptisms and marriages, to the government. And the government has threatened trouble if they register the marriages of converts. So the churches are turning these couples away. 
and these Christian couples are forced to marry in registry offices and say the creeds of a religion that they no longer identify with. Um, and for many of them, it's a deeply painful thing that they can't marry in a Christian ceremony with their church around them. Um, and also, as we also heard, economic pressures on the Christian community are significant. I know what personally of one Christian leader who had his valuable family home and, and lands confiscated because of his Christian ministry, and then his attempts to reclaim it through the courts finally failed earlier this year. And the wife of Rasul Abdullahi, who is one of the Christian prisoners, she was forced to hand over their family home in Tehran in spring of this year because of her husband's conversion. And the wife and their two children are now having a very difficult time. So these are just two examples of the economic pressure on the community. Um, so Christians can't live freely in Iran. They have to live quietly and carefully to avoid being detected. And if their faith is de detected, they can face very harsh treatment. And the problems the community faces are continuations of problems they faced before Rouhani. I can't find any evidence to suggest that there's been any improvement at all since Rouhani took office. So Yakub and Mina and their children knew that um, I was going to be sharing their story with you this morning, and they were pleased that their experiences might shed some light on the situation in Iran. And they are insistent that it's vital to keep raising the issue of freedom of religion in Iran, to keep speaking up for individuals who are suffering. So uh, on behalf of them, um, thank you, Roya, for organizing today, and ACI and Amnesty. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for keeping your 10 minutes with us. <laughs> Haven't been showing you. Um, I know from the conversations we've had from Iran, the Armenian church um, also has problems with the members of its congregation having to be registered with no one else being able to attend. They're not allowed to conduct the services in Farsi. It has to be in Armenian. And um, that's it for, for, so that non-Christians cannot um, participate. Mm. And they've had problems of um, land confiscation and church uh, property being taken away. So although they try and be as um, state happy, um, they still suffer uh, quite a lot. Um, our next speaker is going to be Monira Soleimani. She's the international representative of Balochistan People Party. She's going to talk about um, the situation of um, Sunni women um, from a particular um, viewpoint, which is very interesting. Um, during the conversations that we've had in the last nine months in preparation for today and the report, um, the Sunni community, um, like the Shias, have various sects and some of these sects are not recognized in Iran, and therefore um, the Sunnis um, in Iran um, face persecution, um, although they are Muslims. Um, I've been told of um, schools, the same uh, being headed by non-Sunnis of uh, religious establishments, of having to be headed again by Shia clerics rather mm -hmm. than uh, Sunnis. Um, things that have, and it's the same regardless of where they live. We have Sunnis all throughout Iran, although they may be concentrated in uh, Kurdistan or Balochistan or um, other parts of Iran, but they, they're spread out throughout Iran. And their access to places of worship and all of that is very um, limited. Unfortunately, the person who was going to um, talk to us about the situation for Iranian Sunnis um, couldn't get a visa in time to be here, and we will publish everything, obviously, in, in the report when it comes out. Uh, but I'm happy that Munir is here, and she can at least give us some view um, into the life of women um, in the region. And um, the other point with the Sunnis is the fact of ethnicity. So it's a double thing um, as far as they're concerned, and the sensitivity is therefore that much more on the community. Um, as I said, Monira is uh, Monira Soleimani. She's the international representative of Baluchistan People Party. She's represented the Baluch community at various international <coughs> forums, including the United Nations Permanent Forum on, on Indigenous and United Nations Forum on Minority Issues. We've met the constituents. Um, I'm happy to have you here. Please, ten minutes. Thank, Thank you, you Roya. Um, yes, that was a good sum up, uh, Roya. I will speak about the situation in Baluchistan, focus, focusing on. Uh, crucial elements that uh, can impact uh, equality for women. Uh, these, in, these elements that we can see in Balochistan, they could also be uh, seen in other uh, parts of Iran where you have national minorities, such as Ahwaz or Kurdistan or within the Turkmen. Uh, 
we obviously know that discrimination against women in Iran is institutionalized by the government. Uh, in general, it's hard for women to reach political equality within the existing political framework. Uh, a woman is, cannot move freely. Um, she's not equal uh, in the eyes of the law as men are. Uh, a woman always belongs to uh, her father, her brother, her husband, and in some cases the regime. Uh, so not owning her destiny is, is a crucial point for equality. She should be able to be an individual in the eyes of the law. These uh, elements of discrimination, they're visible with national minorities, with Baluch women. But then we have additional challenges as uh, national minorities. Um, we have um, a set of uh, the ethnicity and the religious aspect that Roya was speaking about. Uh, Baluchistan is today divided between three countries. It's Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Obviously, challenging regimes and maybe not always uh, visible democratic institutions. Uh, the geopolitical situation of Baluchistan puts some spillover effects on regional politics. Uh, it could be politi regional politics such as interstate uh, activities, uh, terrorist activities. The recent uh, spillover effect is the, I want to highlight it because I think it's important, is the religious extremism. It's something that's growing in the Middle East. It's something that's growing in Pakistan. Unfortunately, it has flourished during the last years in Baluchistan as well. Um, Sunni uh, clerks cannot be able to, to be the head of their mosque, but they're letting these extremist fundamentals have their private schools, have uh, being a part of the society, recruiting young men. Um, and in the eyes of the state, this is not a terrorist activity. This is not extremism. For them, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's not from the Sunni Baluch perspective, because these are not the locals that are acting on these religious fundamentalist ideas. It's okay, so they turn a blind eye to it. Um, so basically, this is an international community's uh, challenge, and it should not just be a local assessment in Baluchistan. The regime in Tehran should take this up and try to uh, avoid the situation differing from, from the democratic path that we want to go through. Um, and also the fact of lack of security. I mean, it's quite ironic that I say that in Baluchistan we lack security. Because if you look at the increased budget that President Rouhani put on the Revolutionary Guard with 35%, I should not say this. Uh, but yes, we have, uh, it's a total military zone. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's a military zone. We have the Revolutionary Guard there, we have the police there, we have Mersad there and checkpoint after checkpoint, harassing uh, Baluch people in their everyday life. People living with this sense of psychological terror, not being a citizen within their own state. This has an impact on women traveling, on women going to school, on women just visiting relatives. Uh, and also the fact that uh, we have right now uh, the Mersad not ruling under the central government. They have shoot first, ask question later. Sorry, what's Mersad? Mersad is, um, it's, well, the, the public, um, uh, it's official uh, definition, well, it's, it's a group within the Revolutionary Guard that do not follow strict Revolutionary Guard's ethics. They have their own set of, um, uh, policies that they act on. They do not always have to uh, get back to central government and explain what they're doing uh, in the region. It's a sub, um, how can I, uh, no, someone help me out. It's a sub uh, uh, force within the Revolutionary Guard, basically. And they're more violent and they're more uh, intimidating than the Revolutionary Guards uh, and have a very huge budget. Uh, so. Uh, b being in, in Baluchistan where there's no fostering conditions for democracy basically and 
this is one of the main points I want to make. I want to highlight the excessive usage of the death penalty, um, especially public hangings. Uh, the hangings, the public hangings and uh, executions are, I think, since Rouhani took place, it's about 400 people who have been executed. Baluch people comprise 2% of the population of Iran, amount uh, to approximately 20% of the executions since 2006. Uh, I dare to say that national minorities are disproportionately targeted by, uh, by this treatment. Uh, I dare to say that this is um, something the regime is using to steam unrest and fear in Balochistan. I dare to say that the Revolutionary Guards uh, arrest, harass, their arbitrary arrest, and I dare to say that this is also a crucial element for reaching equality in, in Iran. You have people losing family members, you have uh, family, families losing uh, their breadwinners, women being, uh, um, I mean, we have a very vulnerable economic situation and women losing their young men and their husbands in today's society in Iran are left all by themselves without any state protection. So I think that um, in the sense that, okay, what have Rouhani done for, what has he done for Baluchistan lately? Well, we have not had any visible, we, we, we do have now today two uh, Baluch women who have been elected to local positions, which is very good, and I hope we can see more of that. But unfortunately, uh, it's the Revolutionary Guard that uh, are handling politics in Baluchistan. It is not the locally elected mayors. It's not the locally head of the district. Uh, and there's no accountability uh, of what's happening in Baluchistan. And I think this is something we need to focus on, that the militarization of Balochistan creates a sense of insecurity in the, in the region, and not just because of the geopolitical uh, effect, but of the, the fact that the reg regime is institutionalizing these set of uh, discriminatory acts, uh, the sense of apartheid in the region. Um, I should wrap up and, um, well, I want to see, uh, it's, it's kind of sad sitting here and seeing, hearing all these uh, stories of this beautiful country. And, uh, but unfortunately, the regime in Iran does not know the value of, of a human being. And I, I wish we could strive towards a better understanding of how we could it's institutionalize those acts of, of violence that are occurring from the regime, uh, protecting people from the regime, not only protecting the regime from the people. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. Um, the situation of women, um, religious minorities, is one of the um, important things that we've highlighted in the um, discussions that we had with various faith groups in Iran. Um, it was so complicated to get into how women are treated within their own faith community and living under Islamic law. Um, and so many women were afraid of actually opening up and discussing it because um, so much of what they experience is not exclusively religion, but it's to do with culture and tradition as well. And it's this mixture of everything that's been going on. So that is something that we hope to be able to investigate further at the situation of uh, women, religious minorities in Iran, and to examine and um, try and uh, find out exactly what it is um, that they experience in their daily lives and the kind of problems that they have. Um, the other points that were identified was the education system is very ideological and how children are being brought up. We've heard about um, faith schools having um, Muslim Shia heads, um, but the actual system, the way the textbooks, the curriculum, and all of that is set up, it's very much ideological and it's very much biased towards the regime. We've looked at this in depth in the report, which hopefully we'll be um, publishing it very soon and very shortly. 
But two main points, um, which um, was the biggest obstacle to equality and equitable treatment for Iranians, um, was this right to conversion and right to recognition. Because um, although we have recognized religious minorities in Iran, um, as we've heard, um, although they have protected rights, they still suffer discrimination and persecution and prejudice um, officially in the laws. And also, um, we have, we've heard the stories of people who choose, um, who according to all the international standards, are within their rights to choose um, the faith and the belief that they want to have or not have. So the right to conversion is something that we want to concentrate on. And um, again, it's something that we've uh, put on the last page of the documents that we've put on your um, seats, um, suggestion, su suggested recommendations. Um, so we actually ask for your participation in that part. But one of the most important um, topics and um, obstacles is the f plight of the Iranian religious groups that are not recognized. Um, we constantly hear, and at this UPR we heard again, well, they can drive and they can live and breathe and whatever, so they don't have any problems. The Baha'is in Iran, the Yarasan, or even the dervishes who say they are Shia, Twelver, Jafari um, followers, but because they have a particular way of um, worshipping, um, they are persecuted and they're looked at as Satanists and there have been acts in Parliament last year and there is particular departments within the Ministry of Information that follows what they're doing and there are so many different Islamic propagation departments within Iran that want to um, impact and affect these communities. I'm very happy to have Diana Elai here to talk to us about um, the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. Um, I'm very sorry that we couldn't have uh, representatives from the Yarasan and from the dervishes. Some said that they will be here in the audience and hopefully we can have their contributions. Um, thank you. We can have your contribution in the question and answers. Um, Diane is the Baha'i International Community's representative to the United Nations in Geneva. She's the chair of the NGO Subcommittee on Freedom of Religion and Belief in Geneva. She's the vice chair of the Committee of Racism and Racial Discrimination. She participates actively in the Special Committee of International NGOs on Human Rights. How did you find time to come here today? Um, <laughs> shall I read on? It's a very long list of all these wonderful things that she does. Um, ten minutes, please, Dion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for organizing this. I think talking about freedom of religion or belief in Iran um, is essential because <clears throat> as we have the opportunity, it's the unfortunate opportunity, but it's a good opportunity n nonetheless, to meet with representative of other uh, religious minorities we, and compare notes, we see that the Iranian government actually does not accept anybody who thinks differently than themselves, and that the patterns are very similar, although the extent can be different from one recognized religious minority to a non-recognized, but in fact, the pattern is exactly the same. <clears throat> and excuse me for my, for my voice. Would so you like some water? No, I'm, I'm fine, thank okay. you. So the, the question that you asked was, um, I mean, I, I could make my presentation in two words, or rather, as a, somebody pointed, the repetition of the same word. Is there equality in Iran? No for Baha'is? Have things changed since Mr. Rouhani? No. Um, and it's not so extraordinary. It's because, <clears throat> in fact, the way that the Baha'is are treated is actually quite regulated. And um, there is, first of all, as was mentioned um, earlier on, of course, Article 13 that sets which religious mind, which, which is the religious of the state first, which is the religion of the state, and then which are the recognized religious minorities, and clearly the Baha'is, <coughs> excuse me, are not part of that. But there's also a number of other circulars that are generally confidential, that, but totally in practice, still today, that are put by the Iranian government in order to decide how to treat Baha'is. I think the most um, uh, important one is the one um, that was issued in 1991 by, in fact, uh, discovered by Dr. Shahid's two times predecessor, Mr. Uh, Renaldo Galindo Paul, 
who um, found this document that was uh, prepared by the Islamic uh, Supreme Revolutionary Cultural Council, <coughs> and that lists how to treat the Baha'is. Um, and this document um, actually is still in effect. And we know that it's still in effect because very recently, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about the case of this young um, Baha'i girl who ranked in the, in the national exam as the 113 um, in the entry exam to university, 113 in her field, and yet was not allowed to access university because one of the things that this document says is actually that Baha'is should not have access to higher education. And when she followed through, um, through the authorities <clears throat> to see why she was not in, admitted, because first they just said, her, your file is incomplete, they finally referred her to that 1991 document. So it is clear that these, uh, these documents, and, I will, and this document does not only say that Baha'is should not um, be allowed to have access to university, to higher education, but it also says that Baha'is are not allowed to work in the public um, sector. And so perhaps here, I'll take this opportunity to correct, since we didn't get a chance, what Mr. Larijani said during the UPR of Iran, that he knows or there are a number of Baha'is who are university professors. Well, not only are there is there not a number? There is not even one. Maybe he was referring to BIHE. <laughs> and those who are at BIHE, they, some of the, the, most of them prison. are in prison, yes. So, but I, I think that, so, and, so let, alone, let alone university, but any public uh, profession is forbidden to buy it. So this is in this document. And also the persecution, um, the economic pressure on Baha'is is in this document, as you know. Um, Baha'is are not only properties of Baha'is have been confiscated since the beginning of the revolution, but continue to be confiscated. But also Baha'is do not have access to private work. There is pressure to put, um, <clears throat> for, their for their employers to dismiss uh, Baha'is, for uh, landlords not to rent shops to Baha'is, for business, li business licenses are very easily revoked. And recently, there has been a new trend, in fact, um, of uh, shops being closed, shops that uh, belong to Baha'is being closed. And the latest um, <coughs> incident was because actually Baha'is closed their shops on a Baha'i holiday. So this shows how this persecution is directly linked to freedom of religion or belief or to the Baha'i beliefs. Because Baha'is have holy days like all other religions have holy days. I don't know, Easter, Eid of Faith, right, you know. And Baha'is want to close their shops on those holy days because they're not supposed to work. And just because those shops were closed on those days, which were not, therefore, Muslim holidays, um, they were shut down. Because by closing a shop, you're actually teaching the Baha'i faith. This is what ultimately it boils down to. So um, this financial, this economic pressure is, of course, continuing, and that is also in that document. And finally, the last is also the pressure on children, um, school children. So it's not only that, uh, of course, as we all know, it's, this is very well known that <clears throat> Baha'i youth cannot have access to education, but there's also a lot of pressure on school children. They're ostracized by their teachers sometimes. And also sometimes they're not allowed to register in a school that is close to their home, and they're forced to, be, to go and register in a school that is far away from their home so that they have a lot of traveling and it makes it difficult for them. And this is also indicated in that particular document. It's not the only document either. There is, for example, another other document that lists 25 trades that Baha'is cannot um, uh, have a profession in also based on this circular and also on the um, um, Shiite concept of impurity or Najasat, which you know, Baha'is are not, I mean, anybody who's impure actually does, should not be doing something that would render either food or anything else or just contact with Muslims and make them impure. So this is the situation um, concerning these documents that we have found. Um, 
Heiner Bielefeld, the special rapporteur on freedom of religion and belief that you that has uh, given a message to that you will hear later on, once and I will use his term. He said the Baha'is are um, persecuted from cradle to the grave. So really, it is about children. It is about youth. It is about access to work and employment. It's about old people not receiving their pensions. And it's also about not being able to be buried. In fact, Mr. Ali Younesi, who is the, 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 the representative for minorities of, uh, the special advisor for minorities of, um, of President Rouhani, uh, who in an interview actually clearly stated that I will take care of all religious minorities that are recognized in the Constitution. Therefore, don't come and talk to me about Baha'is because this is not my portfolio. He was in Shiraz attending, I think, a Jewish uh, uh, event when the Revolutionary Guards were actually desecrating the Baha'i Cemetery in Shiraz. So the two, uh, his appearance in Shiraz was exactly at the same time where actually the bones of people who had been killed by the Islamic Republic and <clears throat> other people um, were dug out of the, so the cemeteries, you know, so recent cases of young girls who are not allowed, I can tell you <clears throat> now to be buried. And I can tell you that again, coming back to this really um, unbelievable th thinking of um, uh, teaching the Baha'i faith, in, in Tabriz, uh, uh, so Baha'is were not allowed to go and put flowers on the grave of their parents because that was considered to teach the Baha'i faith. Put, flowers on the grave of their parents. So just to fi finalize this presentation, there are today over 100 Baha'is who are in prison only for their religious beliefs. Baha'is cannot even practice their faith, so it's not only persecution as an individual, as a citizen, as an Iranian citizen who doesn't have the same right as an other Iranian citizen, but also as a religion. Of course, you know that the seven um, <clears throat> Baha'i persons who are managing the affairs of the Baha'i community are in prison and they have been condemned to 20 years imprisonment. And again, just against what the Iranian government said at the UPR, were not even granted a day of furlough. <clears throat> Mr. Khanjani, who is over 80, who is one of them, has not even been allowed to go to his wife's, to the burial of his wife when she passed away. And the number of prisoners, I mean, in the past few years, they have, we, have, we have recorded over 600 imprisonments of, of Baha'is only for their belief. So I think that the situation is very, very bleak, and I will stop here, um, and I hope that um, we can t ask and have yes, some we'll more have, discussions. We'll have discussions. Thank you. Um, in the report, we've looked at every article in the Constitution. For example, Article 28 is the right to employment, um, and again, as an obstacle to democracy, so uh, to equality and democracy, of course. Um, that every, it, it accords the right for every Iranian to have um, employment. And we've just heard um, how the Baha'is are stopped from this right that's accorded. And uh, again, this is in response to UPR when they say that they have citizenship rights and they can do whatever they want. Um, but it's the same for the members of Yarasan and it's, when they're identified, it's the same for um, the Sunni um, people, if they belong to a particular sect, when they're ident identified. These, these kind of impediments happen all throughout the Constitution, and we've sort of listed them and offered examples. Hopefully we'll be publishing it soon. Um, are people from small media here? Yes, you're here. Okay. Um, we've got people from small media who have uh, produced a report recently um, called Heretics, and they're talking about the plight of... Um, Iran's uh, religious minorities access to information where it's not um, readily available. Um, from up, which is best to do? Is it good to put, to do it now, or do you want to do it at the end? Are you ready to do it now? Yes. Okay. So, are you James? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to give my seat to James, who's going to talk for five minutes, not ten minutes that everyone else has had. Um, do you want to sit there, or do you want to no, sit here? Which is it? No, no, um, he can... I don't mind. Is there a clicker, or...? Um, so you I, have okay. to yeah. tell Nassim she's the clicker. <laughs> okay, wave. <laughs> wave, yes. Um, okay, sorry. You can just join us there. Okay. <laughs> so they've, want, they've uh, 
produced a wonderful report. Did you bring copies? Yes, they're people? on the table outside. Okay, so, so if you're interested in his, his report has been published. Mine, I keep saying, is going to be published. <laughs> um, so you can have a look at the wonderful work that they've done. So please, five okay. minutes. Thank sure. you. Okay. Um, okay, so my name's James. I'm from Small Media, and we're a non-profit organisation based here in London. Uh, at Small Media, we aim to increase the flow of information in closed societies. So we make sure that people can use technology securely and effectively. Uh, we develop and promote new discussion spaces, challenge misconceptions, and tell untold stories. Um, the story we're here to share with you today is of Iran's religious minorities. Um, on World Refugee Day this year, um, we published Heretics, which was a report following some of Iran's most, ex following the online lives of Iran's most excluded and marginal faith communities. Uh, this wasn't a completely new topic for us. In 2012, we published a report about uh, educational discrimination against Iran's Baha'i community. Uh, we found that the underground Baha'i Institute of Higher Education was making use of new technology to make connections between educators and students based inside Iran and from around the world. So uh, with the knowledge that groups such as the Baha'i were using technology to push back against the state's discriminatory practices, we decided to widen the net. Uh, Zoroastrians, Jews, Armenian Orthodox Christians are afforded official state recognition and legal protection in Iran, but we knew that they were facing obstacles too, not to mention minority Muslim uh, and evangelical Christian communities. Uh, with this report, we uh, wanted to gauge just how important technology was for all of the diverse Iranian uh, minority faith communities. Uh, so in order to build a complete picture of online life for these groups, we had to draw on a wide variety of sources. Uh, our team pieced together uh, historical accounts, undertook content analysis of community websites and social media pages, analyzed Iranian and international laws, and spoke with a number of community activists um, in Iran and in the diaspora. Uh, taking all of this together, we were able to build a picture of the ways in which different communities were using technology to solve very specific problems. Uh, um, for Iran's officially recognized faiths, we found plenty of websites that work to support local community groups. Groups like the Zoroastrian Women's Organization of Tehran, the Tehran Jewish Committee, or the Armenian Diocese of Esfahan. Uh, these websites function much as the websites of religious organizations in Europe or the United States would. Uh, they publish details of local community events, uh, newsletters, are fairly infrequently updated. Um, but nonetheless, they receive uh, moderate levels of traffic and undoubtedly serve a function for the communities that they serve, uh, helping to facilitate communication between religious leaders and community members. Um, whereas these groups can engage with their community publicly, generally speaking, online and offline, uh, unrecognized and more heavily persecuted groups like the Baha'is and evangelical Christians, Christian converts, must be more innovative. Accessing blocked social networks via circumvention tools, uh, they've built vibrant new online spaces in which they can communicate, organize, and express their faith. Uh, these groups are joined by diaspora-rooted organizations who offer technical and financial support and operate satellite TV stations, which we found to be important lifelines for minority communities. Baha'i stations work to dispel public misconceptions about the Baha'i faith, while Christian TV stations uh, provide converts with regular sermons and the chance to participate in services from the safety of their living rooms. And though diaspora Iranians are doing much to support communities in Iran, Plenty of Iranians inside the country are using technology to organize against repression. Uh, evangelicals whose Persian language Bibles have been banned are accessing online versions instead. They're doing this in lots of different ways. Some activists gather in public spaces and silently exchange uh, religious materials via Bluetooth, um, whereas others work to smuggle uh, Bibles in on encrypted SIM cards and distribute them within the country. Um, 
long-suffering adherents of Iran's Sufi orders are also embracing digital networks as a means of community organization. Although it's been blocked over 40 times, the Sufi news website Maj Zuban has emerged as a leading organization campaigning for human rights in Iran. Its success has come in part due to its eagerness to embrace and support citizen journalism, um, asking readers to submit their own stories of abuse via email and then publishing them on the website. Um, what can the international community do to support the work of these organizations? First and foremost, external actors should make every effort to listen to the lived experiences uh, of minorities on the ground. Persecuted uh, faith communities are often accused of being agents of Western governments, and so campaigns should always be very careful to minimize the chance um, of playing into this narrative. Um, the biggest issue for many online religious minorities is security. Uh, Baha'i and evangelical communities making use of open chat rooms and social media pages uh, are at constant risk of infiltration by state intelligence services. Uh, the development of safer platforms and online spaces for religious discussions and activism uh, would immensely improve the position of these communities. And the visibility of religious minority communities in Iran is still remains quite low, um, especially the plight of Iran's minority Muslim communities, and greater efforts should be made by human rights organizations to draw attention to the situation of these groups and campaign for the rights of minority faith communities on the international stage. All too often, the only groups campaigning extensively on these issues are those representing the persecuted communities in question. So events like this, with a very strong focus on interfaith dialogue and cooperation, are incredibly important to this process. And thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it shows how important it is to be able to support these um, exchanges of information from outside with inside, as difficult as it is and as illegal as it is, because um, even accessing these websites is an offence, mm -hmm. is a criminal offence. Um, so it's very valuable. Thank you for the... Uh,